Brian Stan here with ASAP Frontline, joined by one of my favorite people that I really haven't seen that much during life, but I feel like we've connected um, initially at the SMAC conference in Dublin, Ireland, and that's the first time I ever met him, ever interviewed him, and I'm thinking, who the hell is this doctor from Canada that's wearing the Batman mask? And come to find out that uh, everybody else in the world knows exactly who you are, and so the Bat Doc... Um, Dr. Ken Milne from Ontario, Canada, also um, the host of The Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine, one of my regular rotations for podcasts I listen to, definitely one that not only focuses on evidence-based medicine, but digs into that evidence to determine really what is there. And um, speaking of talking nerdy, it's one of those things that I'm glad you talk nerdy because... I honestly can't even fathom digging as deep down into those things as you do. So, Dr. Milne, Bat Doc, thanks for joining me. I think you just I think you just unmasked me. You just gave away my not so secret identity. <laughs> Fair enough. That's the way we roll here on the front line. <laughs> well, it's a real privilege and an honor to be on front line. Always like to be on front line with quality people. So what we wanted to talk about today is there's a huge focus uh, has been on evidence-based medicine. And we were talking about it early during the council. You may hear some background noise, some ambiance here at ASEP 17. We're in the council meetings, and so we broke away for some lunch. And I wanted to grab you because we were talking about, and what's been discussed inside some of the council has been some of this evidence that's shifting things and committing the things before the evidence is there. And you've actually made some comments recently on a social media site with regard to some evidence and Clearly, some folks that didn't know the evidence or understand the evidence have jumped on there, as with social media, the trolling is very common. Anywho, but we wanted to talk about the evidence. I remember in medical school, I'd be hearing that eventually 50% of what you've learned here will be considered malpractice. Unfortunately, we just can't define which 50% until we get to the end and we can look back and say, wow, we were doing some bad things. And so talk about evidence and where we are now, because there's been a huge push, clearly there's some of these big journals out there that are putting some suspect evidence, quote unquote, loose quotes around that evidence out there that we've been trying to fight off from an emergency medicine standpoint. And But now there's also looking at the evidence and how evidence evolves. And, you know, I guess we could use the context of what you were talking about with the sucrose for children on something that's researched ad nauseum. Yeah, and I think that it's really important that we start with every physician who's practicing emergency medicine, because this is the podcast we're doing. Every physician wants to do the best they can for their patients, and they're all practicing evidence-based medicine. I always reassure everyone is practicing evidence-based medicine, because if you were taught that, that's one level of evidence. So you are practicing evidence-based medicine. What I hope to achieve is that we can up our game, we can improve it, we can do better, and we can perform higher standards of evidence. But I know that there is some confusion around the whole terminology of evidence-based medicine. And there's some misconceptions. So I want to, if it's okay with you, I'd like to clear that up right away. So clearing up what is evidence-based medicine. Well, if you look at the official, you know, definition from the early 1990s, it's supposed to be the conscientious, explicit, judicious use of the best evidence in making individual patient decisions. Okay, great, super. What does that really mean? It doesn't mean it's all about the literature. And that's what people get stuck on, I think. And I want to get people unstuck from that. It's not just about the literature. It should not dictate your care. The literature, because you read a paper, shouldn't be, thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that. It should guide our care, inform our care, instruct our care, but not dictate our care because we have patients with values and expectations that we need to meet that may not have been in the studies that we're talking about. And then you, as a professional, still have to use your judicious judgment. You have to use your judgment on how you interpret that literature and then apply it in a shared decision-making environment with the patient you're trying to provide that care to. So I just want to, you know, off the bat, let's make sure we're not going, oh, what's the literature say? Because what's the literature say is to guide our care. It's not to dictate our care. One of my favorite things that you do on your podcast 
is you're very intentional in when something comes up as a clinical decision rule of correcting that to a clinical decision tool. And that rolls into what you were just discussing, that we shouldn't, we're not, we're not going to have a biblical application of our literature, and rather it is contextualize the literature and the evidence and what we see and what we've experienced and all, you know, everything put together. I mean, evidence is evidence. You know, when you go to a court case, it doesn't, evidence doesn't mean just the bullets. It doesn't mean just the knife. I mean, you guys may not know about those sort of things like we have here in the U.S. when it comes to the knife and gun club. So it's, it's not the moose attacks. It's, it's everything that comes together to put that case together. Talk about that more because I think that's awesome the way you, you even correct the guests that you'll have on there, even the authors. And they'll say clinical decision rule, and you're like, eh, stop, stop right there. You hit the whammy button. Yeah, and it's usually with Ian, Ian Steele who came up with those Ottawa ankle tools, Ottawa, ank- or, uh, Ottawa knee tools, those clinical decision instruments. And we, so we go back and forth, Ian Steele and I, who created them. And I just, and, and he agrees that, I mean, these should be, again, something that we use that informs us as tools, not rules. Because, you know, rules tempt us to break them. And, you know, if we don't follow them, we'll be criticized. And it shouldn't be like that. We should be nice to each other. We're all in it to provide the best care to our patients based on the best evidence. And so I hopefully do it gently when people come on the show as guests to say, oh, you mean a clinical decision tool to guide our care. The only rule I think we should have is that the rule should be we should try to help every single patient we come into encounter with. And so we should have an NNT, a number needed to treat, of one to provide benefit in some way. And it might be okay, they're not going to make it. But we can provide comfort. We can provide compassion. We can provide empathy. It doesn't necessarily mean we're going to fix it or cure them. And when you define something as rule, it suggests everything revolves around those criteria as opposed to what you were talking about just in the end of one, that a tool, the information then revolves around your patient. And instead of, I think so often we look at these what we consider rules and try to make things fit into that as opposed to taking that and saying does this facilitate or help this patient is it applicable to this patient can I put it in there what's going to keep this from being such as you know there's looking at you know pregnancy or age when it comes to PE and DVT predictions based on the limitations of the studies that were out there and you know so I feel like that, you know, just reinforcing that. I, I think when we look at things that are out there, especially with EMRs that now have all of these tools that are lined up in there, is keeping them as tools and not as the rules in order to dictate care, <clears throat> uh, dictate care, but also trying to, um, but more more importantly, trying to facilitate the care of that individual patient. And one thing when we were walking up here, we talked about was that, you know, over. <coughs> I'm going to die on this french fry while you were talking. I'm eating french fries. And clearly I tried to breathe french fries. But walking uh, walking up here, we talked about, uh, we were talking about how things have evolved. You know, even literature, knowledge, evidence evolves over time. And one of the weaknesses I feel that many physicians have is, especially when you're separated from academia is that many times your education and information freezes that you choose you cherry pick it's almost like we do with social media and with our news and things like that we pick things that that reaffirm what we currently believe it's we have a hard time keeping an open mind and being challenged of saying of constantly being open saying is what i believe and what i know the truth and facts based on the information that's out there or am I just trying to find information that reaffirms that? So I ask you, how do we encourage that continue open process and evolution as the evidence evolves over time, whether it's because of the, the situations, the populations, the tools we have out there? How do we make sure that that is pulled into practices and that we don't use our biases to guide our evaluation and review of research. Well, I'm going to pull out a uh, American quote here then. Uh, we don't 
become lifelong learners because it's easy. We choose to do it because it's hard, but it's also the right thing to do for our patients so they can get the best care based on the best evidence. And I think we all have that drive still in us, although it can be dulled over the time because it's difficult to do, but it still needs to be done. So how do you do it? How do you do it effectively? And I think that's a fantastic question. So stay skeptical. That's key. You know, stay questioning. Why am I doing what I'm doing? What is the evidence for what I do? Am I standing on pillars of salt and sand? And most of the time, if you look back at the original research, you go back to the primary literature, most of the stuff we do is not based on super strong evidence. And so we have to be careful about really taking strong opinions on how to best take care of patients. Again, it's supposed to inform us, not dictate it. And remember, if we should be nice to each other, so we shouldn't be shaming and blaming each other about what is the best thing to do for individual patients. We should be working collaboratively on that. So look back at the literature, be skeptical of the literature, be skeptical of yourself. So always reflecting on your own practice and then having the ability the tools, the resources to actually access the information quickly because we're working like this. Boom, 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 next patient. You can't sit there and stare at your navel, right? You need to move on to the next patient or the three or four that you're juggling all at the same time. And so how do you do that? And, And this is one of the reasons I'm really thrilled to be on your podcast is because I think social media can answer that question to be able to time leverage, to be able to turn your car into a classroom, to be able to go for a 10K, oh, sorry, six mile run. Got to remember, I got to translate this, go for a six mile run and have that. um, So that would take, okay. Yeah. So you could listen to a podcast or two, depending on how long your show is. So you could listen to it. And so you could incorporate that information. And then the issue becomes, how do you judge what's good and what's not? And of course, I'm a bit of an EBM nerd, so I'd go back to some research by Brent Toma on that, on how to judge podcasts and blogs for quality. Our goal here is more of a 5K type link. I mean, that, that is actually one thing that we have adopted from the uh, kilometer thing is our road races. So the, the 5K, the 10K, and then, and of course, we get to the half marathons and marathons, but that's the only one area. I think here in the United States, most people have a harder time. They're, they can better contextualize the 5K and 10K than they can translate it into 3.1 or 6.2 mile standpoint. So it's rubbing off a little bit. The problem and concern that I have and things that I've noticed, and I think it's much of the goal that you have in you, it's in your title, The Skeptic's Guide, is that just because it's in print, just because it's in a journal, doesn't necessarily mean it's true, doesn't mean it's quality. And with the amount of influence that's out there, we can many times find the answers we want if we're trying to search for a certain answer, if we want an outcome. And I think that's what we talked about when we are talking about the sucrose. In the sucrose studies, you mentioned like 200 billion trillion studies, is the fact that it feels like to me that somebody's not happy with the findings thus far and is looking for an alternative. And a great example of can't believe everything that you read is the autism information that came out that is still driving the anti-vaxxer argument in many cases. Now, clearly bad data has been retracted, but that's the that's the challenge and how damaging bad information and bad research and bad evidence can be is that it echoes just because you pull it back doesn't mean it stops it's, it's like pulling us a, a stone out of the water that you've thrown in there it doesn't stop the ripples and you know, so we're still seeing that how can we look at data and information and, and evidence and articles and you clearly have a knack for it I'm not as good at being able to dig down there and say, oh, look at that, look at those values, those numbers, the statistics, and it's clearly bad. What can we do to look at it in order to understand or even have that skeptic, that skepticism that you are pushing for when it comes to looking at the research and evidence? Well, if you start with the null hypothesis that 
most research um, you, that is not proving what they set out to prove, so you're accepting the null. If you look at the work done by the rock star, uh, John Ioannidis, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced his name, why 90% of uh, current publication findings are incorrect. And I've paraphrased the title of his study. But if you start with that, you go, okay, well, if I'm reading this paper, they have to show, they have to prove, the burden of proof is on them to demonstrate that what they are putting forward is in fact been shown or demonstrated or proven. So in the case of, let's say, something with efficacy. So it's on them to prove that it works, not on the other person to say it doesn't work. It's on them. And if they haven't met that burden of proof, you revert back to the null and say, well, great, your burden hasn't been proven. But to get into it, I read the methods first. I read the methods first because it all flows from the methods. If the first line says, this was a retrospective, observational, non-randomized, unblinded, blah, 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 you know, already it's like whoop, whoop, whoop. All they're going to be able to claim is associations. So that's an easy one. And then you get into the studies that say, well, this is randomized. Super. Was it blinded? Oh, no, it wasn't. So now I've got to deal with the placebo effect. And that is strong and it is powerful and it is real. And then after that, after you go from um, retrospective observational to prospective and uh, uh, trials to blinded versus unblinded, then you're starting to get down into the other stuff. And so... It's an iterative process. You can get better at it. You can get, I, I mean, I'm a community doc. I'm a frontline pit doc, I think you call them down here. I work in a small community hospital. I am not in surrounded by a whole bunch of other academics. I'm not. I think I'm an academic center of excellence. In this case, I call it a rural ACE, a rural academic center of excellence, because I think it's where your you know, brain is, not where the, um, <clears throat> you know, the bricks and mortar and the ivory is. Um, wherever you are, you bring to the table. So um, you can get better at it. I had to work at it, but it's fun and it's exciting. And, and boy, is it rewarding when you know that you're giving your best to the patients that you're charged with serving. One thing that we've found, you know, when we're dealing with a lot of this stuff that's coming from the insurance industry about talking about ER costs and out of network billing and all that that stuff, is it's, it's getting harder and harder to uncover the conflicts. It used to, it was it was stated right there at the back of the article. It was right there, but now even if you looked at if you look at JAMA, New England Journal of Medicine online versions, you have to dig down. Often going at different sites, even the print versions, you have to go online and search it and find it in order to get these these bias well uh, these conflicts that can introduce significant bias uh, that are not typically that you're not and if you're you're the lay public and you're lay physician or whoever and you're reading it you think oh wow that's interesting findings I'm going to apply that to my practice but then you dig down to find that it's actually this group that has been funded by this group with the sole purpose of can you know of being there to actually um uh, to support whatever the finding is they're wanting to find so let's say a new drug you know they're going to bring out the positive research and they're going to try to push down and, and quiet any negative research or the negative findings or the side effects or whatever it may be how do we address this now and i think i mean clearly i feel like in the future we need to have the conflict of interest need to be more obvious i mean even here at, at council, we all know each other, and yet you still have to stand up and announce your conflicts of interest when you make a statement about anything. How do we move forward when it's becoming harder and harder to uncover these potential introductions of bias and, and purpose in these research studies? So I think if you start with um, the idea that just because it was published in, let's say, the New England Journal of Medicine doesn't make it right and it doesn't make it wrong. What it means was it's published in the New England Journal of Medicine, full stop. If it's sponsored, if it's funded, it doesn't make it right, it doesn't make it wrong, it means it was funded, but it does make me more skeptical to dig a li little deeper. So that's one of the things that sets off my radar, my skeptical radar is funded or not funded. So if I see funded, and I think we should have transparency, so we should recognize and say, has this been funded or what are my conflicts of interest financially or intellectual conflicts of interest, says, some authors, their whole career is based on their research. And so they have intellectual conflicts, but that's hard to quantify. Financial conflicts of interest, again, it doesn't make it right. There's lots of people that have produced really good research that have been funded, 
So it doesn't tell us whether it's right or wrong. It just tells us that it's funded. But we should get a bit more skeptical about it and then dig in deeper and say, did they actually prove? Did they meet their burden of proof for their conclusions? Do their conclusions relate back to the methods they used and the results they found? Now, interesting that you're bringing this up today. It's the 27th of October. I think it was the 26th, but it may have been the 25th. I'll have to go back. But the BMJ just published a study on editors of major specialty journals. And I just sent out a tweet about that yesterday. And it it was very interesting um, on how many journals of the editors of the journals didn't take any funding, and then how many did take funding, and then how much that funding was. And I think that was very revealing, because up until that point, I didn't really appreciate those conflicts of interest. So it's always evolving, and that's why we're lifelong learners. I noticed that. I actually saw that come across, and that's one of the things that got a little bit of a, got a a few of the trolls out from under the bridge throwing darts that you crossed over, was, you know, talking about some of those those conflicts and the money that's involved and that's that's why it's so difficult is even in medicine we 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 wear this white coat i know that's figurative in most cases i don't even own one the but the white coat the white coat represents we're scientists and i think it was co-opted about a hundred years ago when i believe it was called the flexner flexner report that came out of the u.s looking at the different medical schools and trying to get them more scientifically based and more scientifically sound and it was a big report that came out about a hundred years ago and we co-opted that white coat because we wanted to be the scientists we wanted to look at the evidence we wanted to be objective and i think that we need to continue whether or not we actually wear the white coat, but I think figuratively we still need to represent that. We are still scientists. We're still looking at the evidence and applying it in clinical practice to the patients we're trying to give the best care to. Well, if you look at the color, the, well, the, basically the lack of colors, the white, it represents, it represents cleanliness. It represents purity. It represents honesty. And I mean, I think that's what the white coat for medicine is supposed to represent is that the fact that we are treating you and doing the best we can, that we're, yeah, above the fray of a lot of that stuff. But then if you dig down, that underbelly's got a little moss growing on it. It's got, it's a little bit dirty. You get down in the weeds, there's a few snakes in there and, and made some bugs and some dirt. And, and that's, you have to look for that. When you're looking for your evidence, you can't base your practice in treating a human being that's sitting in front of you in your emergency department based on the research that's out there that may or may not. And you talked about, looking at the methods and basically what you're referring to there is the number of ways we can introduce bias and error and things that are not generalizable across the population that we're going to see in your department 24 7 and across the country and across different countries and, and situations and so that's what we're trying to do is looking for that research that takes out all possible or as many as possible different ways but then even if the research is clean and can put on that white coat, then you're talking about what you're talking about there is the editors, the reviewers. They can introduce their own bias that gets it into the article or gets it out, kicked out of the article or gets it kicked out of the journal. And what we found in the, the case of the article that we were dealing with from the ASAP standpoint was the industry coming in and pushing money through there to not only support the, the study, but also get it into the article, uh, get it into the journal as well. So those are some important things and some of the other recordings that we're going to do here at ASAP 17 are going to get, be, deal with some of that practice changing uh, research, which in many cases, the practice changing research is not necessarily, we've just finally decided to study something we've never studied before. It's actually correcting errors of the past more than anything else. And so we're going to talk about a lot of that stuff. We're going to have a lot of those folks on board because I think that's the important stuff to bring on here because I want everybody, and I think the strength of foam education and exactly what your podcast does is trying to get that information out to people as soon as possible. You mentioned on yours, the, your, your, your kicker is always that translation, working that translation of your podcast of, of, of research and information, uh, cut it down. And that's what foam education can do. And, um, and I want us to be able to do that. I want us. To, I think that podcast is a way to get that information out there, but I also want you to think critically. You need to be that skeptic. And, um, you know, I think your podcast is wonderful for that. So with that in mind, 
close up with any thoughts, then you can give your tagline uh, because you can actually do it correctly. Okay, so final thoughts. Final thoughts on this is I don't want to get lost in the weeds, right? And I do a skeptical podcast. That's great. Um, and, and part of that embedded, you know, the medium is the message and all that stuff. But embedded in that, I want to teach people some nerdiness, not just the clinical side, but the combination of the clinical. But hopefully they can pick up one or two things that helps them with their critical appraisal skills and understanding the literature. But from a big picture standpoint, that 10,000 foot view, if you're, if you're that far back, you've got to remember two things. What we do matters, but what we do also doesn't matter. You know, we, we you know, get all excited about the p-values and the likelihood ratios and the number needed to treat and stuff like that. The big things in medicine have been done. Get vaccinated. Don't smoke. Things like that, you know, and now we're in the margins and that's, that's, you know, we're modifying our practice. There's very few things that would say, oh my goodness, I'm just going to change everything I do. It's more like we're just tweaking it a bit. We're in the margins. We're tweaking it a bit. And, and so I, I wouldn't want people to get, oh, well, I did it this way or did it that way. We should be nice to each other and say, oh, well, you made your best choice based on the best evidence that you had at the time and your heart was in the right place. Good for you. And now let's have a talk about this new study that came out that may modify your practice. It may not. Super. That's what I want to leave people with. What you do matters. But don't get lost in the weeds to think, oh, well, you know, if I didn't do it this way or I didn't do it that way based on some, you know, obscure statistics or limitations. That's not the take-home message. The take-home message is to have a number needed to treat of one. Try your best. Do it with every patient. And remain skeptical of your own knowledge gaps. And what's your tagline? Remember to be skeptical of anything you learn, even if you heard it on the Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine. Or ASAP Frontline. So thank you very much, Dr. Ken Milne, Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine. Definitely one that you need to have on your device, whatever whatever device you choose to have. Listen to that because it's, it is a great way to um, work through a lot of those things. They dig really deep and a lot deeper than I can even uh, pretend to, uh, to comprehend when I'm reading those articles. So I just listen to you guys. That way I can skip the whole reading part because apparently I can hear better than I can read. So maybe that's just a product of Southern schools back in the 70s. I don't know. We'll find out. As for me, you can contact me, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com, at everydaymed on Twitter. I should mention that uh, Dr. Milne is at the S Gym. T-H-E-S-G-E-M on Twitter as well. And until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline.